chapter 2, who was the first person? Like most chapters in the book, it's headed by a, a few myths, and uh, in this case I've got a Tasmanian Aboriginal myth, and a Norse myth, a Valhalla myth of uh, the origin of the first person. All cultures have had origin myths, all cultures have had creation myths, and I've just chosen three of them. The third one I chose was the uh, Jewish myth of Genesis, the myth of Adam and Eve. Um, I toss in the, the Judeo-Christian myth along with the others. Um, there's nothing special about it, it's just a, just a myth like any other. And then we come to the meat of the chapter. Who was the first person really? There never was a first person. Because every person had to have parents, and those parents had to be people too. And they had to have parents, and they were people too. There never was a first rabbit, never a first crocodile, never a first dragonfly. Every creature ever born belonged to the same species as its parents, they belong to the same species as its grandparents and so on, and, and its great-great-grandparents, and its great-great-great-great-grandparents, and so on, forever. Forever? No, it's not as simple as that. That's going to need a bit of explaining. A thought experiment, a thought experiment in your imagination. What we're going to imagine is not literally possible because we go, go way, way, way back in time, long before you were born. Take a picture of yourself, say a photograph of yourself, put it on the table. Lay on top of it a photograph of your father. Lay on top of that a photograph of his father, and his father, and his father, and so on, for a very, very large number of generations. A very, very large number of great, 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 great grandparents. How many greats do we need for our thought experiment? I should think about 185 million would do. <laughs> it's not easy to imagine a pile of 185 million pictures. It would be about 220,000 feet high, that's more than 180 New York skyscrapers standing on top of each other. So we're going to tilt it on its side, put it in a bookshelf, running 40 miles. The near end of the bookshelf is a picture of you, next to it is the picture of your father, next to his father, next to his father, and at the far end of the row of pictures is your 185 million greats grandfather. What did he look like? An old man with wispy hair and white side whiskers? A caveman in a leopard skin? Nothing like that. That's your 185 million greats. <laughs> a fish. He was a fish. So was your 185 million greats grandmother. Or they wouldn't have got on. There's an element of paradox, but it's not a very profound paradox in my statement that every species ever born, every individual ever born, belonged to the same species as its parents. And yet if you go back through enough generations, starting with a human, you'll come to a fish. It's not that paradoxical because, after all, we're very used to the idea of things changing gradually. We were all once babies, then we became toddlers and then we became children, and then we became teenagers. But there was never a moment when a baby went to bed at night and woke up as a toddler. And never a moment when a toddler went to bed and woke up as a child. These things happen gradually, and you notice only after a while, ah, he said, looks though he's growing up, doesn't it? Um, there are sort of arbitrary points, like the 18th birthday, when by law, we say we have reached adulthood, but everybody knows that nothing special happens on your 18th birthday. <laughs> Let's go back along our row of postcards of photographs and pick out a few. Um, there you can see your 4,000 great grandfather, who's pretty much the same as us, 
your 50,000th great-grandfather would have been a member of a different species, Homo erectus. But, to repeat my point, there never was a moment when a Homo sapiens baby was born to Homo erectus parents. It all happened much too gradually. You notice the change if you walk sufficiently far along the road of postcards. Or you notice the change if you travel sufficiently far into the past with what that means. But you don't notice the change if you just look at each generation one at a time. Your 250 million, 250,000 great grandfather, six million years ago, would have looked something like a chimpanzee, and it would have been the common ancestor of ourselves and chimpanzees. It would have been no more closely related to a modern chimpanzee than it is related to us. It was the common ancestor. It probably looked a bit more like a chimpanzee, which means that that lineage has changed a bit less than ours. Walking further along the shelf of pictures, we come to 25 million years ago, and your one and a half million greats grandfather, who would have been perhaps something like a monkey. Your seven million greats grandfather, 63 million years ago, might have looked a bit like a bush baby or a lemur, and would have been the common ancestor of modern bush babies and lemurs, and of modern humans and apes and monkeys, and would have been no more closely related to modern bush babies and lemurs than to us, though it might have looked more like them. Your 45 million greats grandfather, 105 million years ago, some, something like a shrew or a tree shrew. Your 170 million greats grandmother, 310 million years ago, the ancestor of all reptiles and of all mammals and birds. Um, it's been drawn as sort of a bit like a lizard, but we don't know whether it's really like that. Uh, your 175 million greats grandfather, 340 million years ago, the common ancestor of modern salamanders, it looks a bit like a salamander, and frogs, and of us. And then, this is where we came in, 417 million years ago, your 185 million greats grandfather, that fish. And of course, we don't stop there. The line of picture postcards wends its way on and on into the past. And at some point, we start to run out of fossils and they become less and less clear what our ancestors looked like, but it's fairly clear that they uh, would, have, would have eventually been single-celled animals, single-celled creatures, more like bacteria perhaps. Now I'm going to skip to chapter 5, which is why do we have night and day and why do we have winter and summer? Nobody has much trouble with night and day, if you know, it's because the Earth spins on its axis. Winter and summer, there is a certain amount of problem here. You'd be surprised at the number of people who think that winter is when the Earth is furthest from the sun, and summer is when the Earth is closest to the sun. I was told this story by an Australian. There was a science fiction story in which there were travellers from Earth voyaging away from our solar system towards some distant star system. And they were waxing nostalgic for home. And one of them said to the other, just to think that it's summertime back on Earth. Now remember, it was an Australian who told me that story. <laughs> You'll get it eventually. <laughs> the truth, of course, is that winter and summer um, is nothing to do with how close the, uh, the Earth is to the Sun. The Earth's orbit is almost circular, it's not quite circular. Um, I believe that at present we are closest to the Sun in January. Uh, and the, the real reason for winter and summer is the tilt of the Earth's axis. But in the course of this chapter, I wanted to explain what it means for something to be in orbit about anything. And this is a good opportunity for me to introduce the app, which goes with it. 